welcome to sci Entrepreneurship, an old turtles podcast series that takes a look at how science fiction inspires people to envision the future and then create it or run away from it screaming. <laughs> Either depending way. On, yeah, depending <laughs> on what sci-fi we're talking about. Depending on if it's dystopian or utopian. In this episode, speaking of, I guess it's mostly dystopian, although some, I think it'd be kind of yeah, cool. I think it depends on how you see it. Yeah. In this episode, we're going to be talking about one of the most iconic science fiction movies of all time, The Matrix. The Matrix features Neo, an office worker by day and hacker by night, who meets the infamous Morpheus. Morpheus tells Neo that none of what he thinks of as reality is actually real. And he is a victim of the Matrix, a massive AI system that has tapped into people's minds and created the illusion of a real world while using their brains and bodies for energy and then kind of tossing them away like spent batteries when they're through with them. And we have three overachieving guests to uh, talk about the impact that the Matrix had on their lives. Dan Novi's back. He works at the MIT Media Lab, where he created the class called Sci-Fi to Sci-Fab. We have Emily Dean, a writer and director whose debut film, Andromeda, tells a tale of an android who develops human consciousness. And Peter Eckersley, who's the director of research at the Partnership on AI and is the former chief computer scientist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Let's meet Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Eckersley. These days, I'm the Director of Research at the Partnership on AI, which is an organization that exists to ensure that there is great productive relationship between humans and artificial intelligence. Prior to that, I worked at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, trying to make sure that the internet worked the way we wanted it to, that it provided privacy, freedom of speech, space for innovation, creativity. Could you talk a little bit more generally as science fiction as a whole has inspired you and led you to where you are today? Science fiction is really interesting if you are trying to predict or perhaps ambitiously shape the future of technology and the way that it plays out. It's really hard to predict the future uh, with unknown technologies or, or even in general. And so science fiction provides guideposts, ideas, possible ways that things should play out, narratives. And we cannot help but be deeply influenced by it as as futurists and technologists. It's really one of the only tools we have for trying to anticipate and mitigate unintended consequences or identify great ones and, and go for them. When did you first see The Matrix? What was something that stuck with you? So I saw the first Matrix film in cinemas, And the moment I most remember from that film, the first one, uh, is the rant that Hugo Weaving goes on. You know, humanity is a virus. This disgust that he expresses as a perfect robot for the human species. And then, of course, the irony in the second film... Uh, which I loved, and I think a lot of other people didn't love. Yeah, yeah was, we're, we're on the hater side. It, 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 it picked up all these threads and kept running with them. I mean, you know, in the second film, Hugo Weaving's character literally, it mutates and becomes a computer virus that's copying itself infinitely. And so there's this clever reference where the, the accusation he has made comes back uh, and becomes him. The film is just full of things like that that I found glorious. I, you know, I think to the third film really loses the plot and becomes just this series of very overextended action sequences that really, you know, you can watch the first 30 minutes of the, the third film and then just stop because there's there's not much more after that. But I thought the second one was actually quite interesting. And then he goes on to become an elf, so it still has a disdain for humanity. So the character arc is pretty, pretty believable. The futurology works. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should watch the second one because I just remember hating two and three, but I've only seen them once. I know, me too. I'll give a couple of examples of things I love in the second film. There's this scene where he's trying to get to the Oracle and he encounters this character, the Seraph, and they meet in this tiny little Hong Kong noodle house. Uh, and then suddenly Neo is attacked by this guy and they f- they fight on the tables in this, this classic setting. And after they fight to a draw, the Seraph is like, okay, I can take you to the Oracle now. And Neo's like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, he's like you do not truly know a person until you have fought them. And so as I'm watching this, you know, it's a very, very cute kind of samurai thing. But I'm like, oh, this is a challenge response protocol. We have those in computer security. Like, this is the way that this character in a virtual reality gets to know that the thing on the other end really is what it says it is. And and so there are just these beautiful vignettes of taking computer science ideas and dropping them into a, a fight scene. And I don't think there's enough literature, enough text that that thinks about great ways to do that. What did you think about the um, the 
plot line of uh, kind of the more basic one of the AI using humans as fuel, literally as as batteries, which is kind of stupid, but fine. So the AI is using the humans as batteries. This is, of course, one of the most, probably the most bothersome thing about the first film. Right. You, you see this and you think that's just dumb, ridiculous. There's no way of justifying this concept at all. Right. You, I kind of thought like, what's the matrix that the machines are living in where they believe that that's what they're doing? <laughs> like, what's actually going on? I heard a rumor that there was a better... Ver- so if you, if you take this plot line, you say, well, the Wojcicki siblings were clearly smart enough to not put something this silly in, right? Like, how did it get in here? And then you try and fix the idea. The best fix that I was able to come up with was, oh, use the humans' brains, not their bodies as batteries. Use their brains as computers. Because we do have these impressive computers in our head. So maybe what's going on is the AIs are like living in this simulation that's using our brains. I heard a rumor that there might have been a draft of the script that worked that way and got edited out because it would be too crazy and confusing for too much of the audience. Alternate theory, most of the people in the batteries are actually got there the way that Cypher tried to. They've chosen to be in there and they've programmed the machines with this completely irrational thought that they need the, to enslave the humans to uh, to use them as batteries, where really they're just making them uh, happy, give us a, a pleasurable <laughs> simulated experience. Oh, I think we can have both of our theories at once. <laughs> Probably. When we build the Matrix in the future, we can we can do it this way. Uh, now, that segues into our next question nicely. Right. <laughs> so how would you say this has been an inspiration to you in your work and what you do? So I think really what it inspires is, is the combination of poetry and art with these technical fields. Philosophy, of course, has that to some degree anyway, but and computer science, like not usually a philosophical or artistic endeavor, but the Matrix really holds up that it can be. Also, probably just great fashion inspiration, right? <laughs> yeah, you kind of came in with your long Neo coat there. Yeah, for those of us who grew up a little, like in the goth subculture a little bit, like clearly the Matrix was the like highest pinnacle of, of where you could take that aesthetic. Yeah, and making this kind of philosophy and nerd culture and computer science actually look glamorous and attractive was, was no small feat. I don't think that's ever been done before. It went from weird science to you know to the matrix is a is a pretty big step change right maybe the matrix was that pivotal moment when geeks went from being the, the like nerdy underclass of the 80s and 90s to the era when really the planet is being clearly run by them uh, and the the matrix could have been historically speaking that cultural tipping point yeah and nothing bad has happened because of that so nothing <laughs> good <laughs> no definitely is there anything else like from an from an ai safety perspective or anything that you would say that this helped you think about it's funny, for a film that's about AIs, like, running the world, I guess, actually, you know, there is one thing, which is don't let your AI copy itself in an unbounded way. That's a really bad mistake. You don't want to have to fight 10,000 copies of Hugo Weaving simultaneously, because <laughs> though they kind of get away with it in the film, in real life, you're always going to lose that fight. I wonder how many copies of Hugo Weaving I could fight. Thanks, Peter, for joining us. As you said, The Matrix shifted the way a lot of people think about the world. It also inspired people to experiment with world building in their own creative work, which brings us to our next guest, Emily Dean. Emily is a Pixar-trained writer and director whose work has been nominated for an Australian Academy, and her directing debut, Andromeda, is a sci-fi drama about an android who develops human consciousness. That's good. It's Andromeda, and it's a drama about androids. Here's Emily. Do you remember when you first saw The Matrix and something that, that really stuck with you? The Matrix I saw in the cinema when it first came out. I suppose the thing that stuck out to me, I'm a very visual person, so the production design was incredible. I think for me, it was one of the first times I'd seen really well done the complete flipping of reality on the screen in cinema. And I think that kind of betrays my film education up until that point, but I had only really seen it done in anime before. And I was a huge fan of cyberpunk anime and Ghost in the Shell and even, you know, Evangelion, Neon Genesis. But The Matrix made it feel real in a way. And I was really sucked into the world and and a digital world like that. Is there a character 
in the matrix that you identified with in any way? Actually, you know, I think we all identified with Neo, right? We can all identify with being disgruntled with our reality in some way or questioning or feeling bristling at authority. And then to find as you poke through what your perception was that you're thrown into a different world and into a different way of thinking. I think we can all say that we've had some kind of experience in our lives where our ideology has been challenged and that we've had to pull ourselves out of that. And we've been exposed to the seedy underbelly of of something and it wasn't what we thought it was, but now we have to face a challenge. I think for me, even though I'm a Asian, mixed race, Australian female, I identified with Neo. How would you say that The Matrix in particular inspired you to what you're doing now? The Matrix really successfully brought digital, like the idea of an internet or a digital reality into the mainstream film language. And I I don't really think a blockbuster quite like it had existed before. And it kind of broke down what it means to live in a physical real world versus in a digital online world. How it has influenced my work, I suppose, is I do a lot of work where characters are taken out of their ordinary environment and their their thinking is challenged and they're thrown into a situation where they have no control and they're completely inept. Uh, Because I actually have a project that is kind of similar (laughs) to The Matrix in the sense that there is an online space that a character ventures into and has challenges to overcome. And it's virtual reality meets an imagination meets a utopia, whereas the real world is kind of like a dystopia and that push-pull. No, I'm just going to assume it's set in uh, in the world of TurboTax. You mean the, the software? Yeah, it depicts. It's the, <laughs> it's the Hollywood version Inverted using the, the TurboTax IP. It even has Hugo weavings everywhere. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing Emily's future projects. Up next, Brittany and I talked with Dan Novi. He recently earned his PhD from the MIT Media Lab. Congratulations to Dan. We'll jump right into Brittany's first question for him. When did you first see The Matrix? I saw The Matrix, I'm going to say either opening night or very, very closely, very close to opening night when it came out in the theaters. I was I was working in the effects industry in Los Angeles. I knew people who had worked on it up in Northern California. And I went with a very large crowd of other visual effects artists. And professionally speaking, we were blown away. I mean, we were looking at some of the stuff they were doing. And as one magician perhaps watches another magician and goes, I maybe know how you're doing that. There were several times we're like, all right, how'd they do that? How'd they do that? It was one of the only films I've seen that a core part of our group came out and went and got back in line and and went and watched it again. Would you call yourself a Morpheus or a Neo or an Agent Smith? I attempt to be Morpheus, I would have to say, overall. Um, We were talking a little bit about my dissertation work, and the first thing I have to explain to people when I talk about my dissertation work is that I am not building the Matrix. First of all, the Matrix is uh, invasive. You actually have to, you know, cut a hole in the human skull and hook up to individual neurons and And we're able to do our work without having to do that. We can non-invasively write to your visual cortex and make you see things that aren't there. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not Agent Smith. The name right now of my dissertation is, is Programmable Synthetic Hallucination. So we're looking at how hallucinations occur naturally within the brain, the mechanics of hallucinations themselves, and then trying to figure out how to turn that around and make it a feature, not a bug. So we know the brain is capable of creating ultra-realistic imagery. We say that the brain is is capable of being a projector, not just a camera. Uh, Most people think of it as a receptor, but it is actually making imagery, especially when something is going wrong. So a, a schizophrenic is seeing things 
that is higher resolution and registered in 3D space and perhaps more real than anything right now a computer can do. And so we know the brain is capable of doing that. And it's like, how is it doing that? And then how do we actually make that happen in a controllable and more importantly, shareable kind of way? The character that that uh, really stayed with me from The Matrix was uh, was Cypher, um, the mm-hmm. character by... Uh, it is, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, by Joe Pantoliano, who basically like opts out of reality, right? Knows what he knows and then decides that actually what he really wants is was not to know it and to be back in. Mm-hmm. He took the wrong pill. Well, but after taking the right pill. He, in hindsight, he realizes he took the wrong pill, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a that was an interesting philosophical idea, people with full will opting out of reality. Yeah, for, for me, that character in, you know, he says he wants to go back. He wants to be somebody important. He wants to be somebody rich. But the thing that really got me philosophically is is he doesn't want to remember anything. He doesn't want to remember making that decision. Yeah, I, I remember watching that movie and just feeling like I can see I can see the attraction of that. I could see myself, you know, I probably wouldn't have made the same choice, but I can definitely see the appeal of it. And, and maybe I would have. Yeah, but would you have knowing you have to kill a bunch of people no, you've been friends with? No, that was the thing. Is I think <laughs> yeah. I think it was like, I, I would have done that if there was a way to just like crawl back into the pod. Yeah. And, <laughs> just you know, escape, find your pod, just yeah. plug back in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I may have done that. But yeah, I wouldn't have done it in, in a way that would be knowingly destructive to other people. Yeah, yeah. But th- that shows how much reality sucked for, for Cypher. For me, what I find more and more interesting about The Matrix, and, and it's very similar to to most rebel stories, stories like Star Wars, uh, uh, is that different types of people take away different messages and see themselves as different characters from the Matrix. So, you know, we have a, a problematic group of men's rights activists who believe that they are Neo. Right. In fact, it's, it spawned the whole like red pill, yes, like, I, it's like men's you rights you movement. Can, you can no longer there. use the terminology anymore in a normal conversation to, you know, it, it was a shorthand for an idea of, you know, yeah. being able to be sort of enlightened or, and now, yeah, now you can't. Now it's like, if you, if you mention red pill, blue pill, you are immediately, you know, somebody will like look at you askance and go, oh, do I have to worry about what I'm going to say around you? Are you one of those? And so it's sort of removed what I felt to be a very important form of conversation out yeah. of out of the vernacular. It's like basically you can't use that terminology anymore. I've got a theory about this, right? Ooh. Because the whole like red pill, blue pill meme becoming corrupted and unusable mm-hmm. in its original deep meaning happened because of the internet. The internet controlled by machines. A little Ooh. bit too convenient. <laughs> the other thing that's been made to disappear from our current lives after the matrix are landlines. Like that's not a thing anymore. There's no way to get out of the matrix because no the landlines are gone. They, they, they took away the landlines so we can't get out. They took away the whole concept of red pill, blue pill. <laughs> so, so we that, can't like, even talk about it? If, you know, Morpheus offers you that in 2018, you would you would immediately think that he's a right wing, you know, crackpot. Yeah, and wouldn't I was like, take it. wait, you love QAnon? <laughs> yeah, I think the machines are doing a good job of uh They of watched the matrix. In. They saw the matrix. <laughs> the matrix is exactly what a machine would make if it were making yeah. a matrix. <laughs> I'd just like to point out that Dayquil is kind of red, but Nyquil is kind of blue. So you do have to be careful. I've if you taken have a both coal. in the last 24 hours. <laughs> so, so, you're, you're, so I've gone from both. You're just candy flipping right now between the Matrix and reality. <laughs> I think the Matrix for me is uh, an exploration of what it means to seek and, and try to find uh, higher realities. So not necessarily in a conspiracy theory kind of way that there are massive... Um, you know, lies being told to us or that we're living in some kind of computer simulation. But for me, it's much more of there are ground truths and greater uh, aspirations that uh, as an artist, uh, as a programmer, as a a maker, as an engineer, uh, that you must continually seek to find. You, You must destroy the old world to make the new world. And for me, that questing behavior is what the the matrix it means for me all right thanks dan so let's continue our now two episode tradition of ending with uh, what we think is our most influential quote from the matrix what uh, what had the biggest effect on you and why well it's hard to say if the matrix is real or not really because it it's, it's not real i don't know are artificial plants real no. They're a different kind of real. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, and they're actually a reality maybe that's like better suited to the world that they inhabit, you know, namely like my apartment, the real <laughs> plants would be. <laughs> Yeah, those plants won't be living. Although the plants in the All Turtles office are doing quite well. Your cactuses are lovely. Thank you. Yeah, so let's do the quote and, and uh, try to do it in your best Joey Pants voice. Free? You call this free? All I do is what he tells me to do. If I had to choose between that and the Matrix, I choose the Matrix. I think the Matrix can be more real than this world. All I do is pull the plug here. <laughs> This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode on a hard line at the world-class Donatello Studios in San Francisco, California. Thanks to Dan Novi, Peter Eckersley, and Emily Dean for joining us today. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com, but Reed reads every message. Speaking of which, thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy Thompson for producing, Chris Plogue for his audio expertise, Ali Packard for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Brittany Gallagher and yours truly, Phil Libin, and the rest of the Old Turtles team, thanks for listening. 